friends, this, this is really special um, for all of us. Uh, both uh, Linda and Mark are very long-term members. Uh, you're almost a founding member, right? I am a founding You are a founding member whose son was the first child ever to be named here at the synagogue. And uh, Mark's uh, late father-in-law was past president Jerry Jacobs of this amazing institution. So a lot of history, you know, probably a hundred years of history right here of Shir HaMalot. Uh, so that. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And so um, it is really a pleasure to have both of you here, both very well accomplished therapists uh, in psychotherapy and really in the world of helping people reach their full potential. And so when Rabbi Zive, Rabbi DePaulo, and I were discussing what the theme of this next year should be, it was almost, uh, as soon as it came to us, we just stopped, we knew that was the theme. That as we create community in a very, very fractured world, in a very fractured world, we have to be better together. And I can guarantee you, we don't all agree with each other. This isn't about um, uh, similar opinions, uh, everybody having to share them, but it is about common values. Um, and tonight, we really want to dig deep as really our first experience of Better Together uh, uh, as we open this year with these two wonderful therapists. So let me just introduce them. But I have to put my glasses on first. Dr. Mark uh, Becker. Um, is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in treating individuals and couples. His uh, office is located in Anaheim Hills with his amazing wife, Cheryl, who's also a therapist uh, and a, a great one at that. And they've been in practice together for many, many years. Um, uh, Dr. Becker's clinical specialties include substance abuse, anger management, anxiety, depressive disorder, stress management, and marriage counseling, and so, so much more. Uh, we are really glad to have you here, Mark, to share your wisdom and your thoughts. I should mention that his eldest daughter is uh, getting married in October. So mazel tov to you, to Cheryl, and to Lois, uh, the grandmother. And to you, Linda Algazi, also a clinical psychologist uh, and a renowned public speaker who's been serving in Corona Del Mar, uh, Newport Beach, Irvine, and Laguna families. It says here for over 30 years, but I think it's a little more since you're... It's a little more. <laughs> Who says shut up to their rabbi on the bima? I don't think that's right. Uh, I really, really encourage you to go to Linda's uh, webpage um, because in it are over 100 articles that she's published. Um, it used to be in the Daily Pilot and uh, uh, just great um, insights about life and love and relationships. So we're really glad to have both of you here. First question um, Really I'm having feelings of insecurity right now. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to talk about that, doctor? <laughs> Simply put, do you believe people are better together than alone? Does being with other people help us be our best selves? Well, obviously, conventional wisdom you have would to use the mic for the people online suggests that we are better together when you look at the research our health, our well-being, our, our um, general satisfaction day-to-day -day is much higher when we're connected to other people. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's just not that simple because in order for all those things to occur, we have to have a constructive relationship with whomever is in our life. So um, I guess that's what I would say to get things going, and I'm going to ask Linda to maybe produce a counterpoint. Well, nobody ever... That is the mic for people online. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, I, I'm really glad to see so many old friends and new friends here supporting us tonight. Mark and I love seeing all of you. Of course, the Bar Mitzvah class, Bar B'nai Mitzvah class last week got many more people. So... <laughs> so but um, I know I'm supposed to say that we're all better together. No, say what you feel. Okay, well, nobody ever called me antisocial, but uh, I've had this ongoing secret fantasy. Part of it is because I'm 
part of the Linda generation. Today in the uh, Wall Street Journal, there was an article about people born my year, one out of eight girls, or 18 girls, were named Linda. So, I mean, that, that's kind, it's kind of interesting to, to think about that. Um, part, so, that's where I'm coming from. I think that I'm going through a stage of life, of my life now, where I'm a caregiver to my husband. And I can remember being a young mother and being equally frustrated with the burdens of that. And I had this ongoing fantasy several times in my life that if I had 24 hours, 24 hours, when nobody called my name or asked me to do something, that it would be absolute, absolute, you know, the, the most wonderful gift that anybody could give me. You know, I remember once my husband asked me, what would I like for my birthday? And I can remember saying, I, I want to go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> you know. So, I mean, some things haven't changed. <laughs> but that's, that's about... I, I can tell you. But Linda, that's about um, having sacred space for yourself. Mm -hmm. But can you envision a whole life uh, without your children, husband, community? I mean, do you no, think... I, I, I love being part of this community. I love being part of my family. I love being part of my marriage. I love all those things. It's just that we have to, we have to leave room for the individuals that we are, and that feeds the, the relationships that we're in. You know, if I'm happy doing something, if I get, you know, a period of time in every day that I can do my own thing, one of the reasons I'm still working, you know, it, it, it really, it makes me feel that I haven't lost my Linda. You know, I'm still, I'm still doing my thing. And I, and I leave, and I have caregivers all over the place, so it, I have to get out of the house because I can't stand that after a while. Absolutely. So... Let, let, Mark, let me drill down just for a minute. Um, we're very conscious about when we say better together during this whole year that it's not only about romantic relationships. Like there are a lot of people who are single or who've lost a spouse or who are divorced or whatever it might be. Tell us about the different kinds of relationships people can have that are meaningful in their lives beyond just a romantic partner. Well, Rabbi, I'm glad you asked that. Oh, well. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day, living in the community that Cheryl and I have lived in for over 30 years. I think some of the most important relationships are casual relationships, the ones that we don't really have a formal word for. For instance, the people that you know we see at the gas station, the cleaners, the person at the restaurant that we go to every week that waits on us. Uh, I think about those people all the time, and I, I really feel a connection because it's familiar, and it's something that kind of bonds me, not only to them, but to the area that I live in. So, you know, to your point, we're not just talking about romantic connections or even family connections, but you think about all of the groups that you've identified with over the course of your life from childhood through uh, adulthood and now even beyond uh, middle age, uh, whether it was a fraternity in college, uh, the neighborhood that you grew up in, uh, the watering hole that you enjoyed, uh, the team that you root for, these all create parts of your identity. And so it's very difficult to argue in my mind that we're better off alone, of, of course, Linda's alluding to the need for solitude and regeneration, and obviously in our profession, uh, we get a lot of relationship time with our patients, and we do need to balance that. So that's not to say that solitude and privacy and quiet time isn't important, but we, we need to feel connected on a lot of levels. Yeah, sometimes I do come home and uh, my wife will say, oh, how was your day, honey? I know she's watching. Uh, um, and I'll say, it was great, but I'm all talked out. Like, I can't talk anymore, and I can't listen anymore. And I just need a half an hour, and then I can re-engage. But that, that is really important. In order for me to be a good partner, for me to be in a relationship, you need some space in relationship. There, 
there was some, recently there's a, a whole bunch of stuff that was written about the fact that men in particular have limited number of words that they can use in a day. And by the time they come home, they've used Nobody, their whole house. Nobody's ever accused me of that, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah, so um, where's Stacy? I thought I saw Stacy Blyweiss, our membership director. She taught me something uh, a month or so ago uh, called chapter friends. That is, you have friends in different chapters of your life. And I just thought that was fascinating. I've been thinking about it ever since she mentioned it to me. And what I thought is, and I would love your feedback here, Linda, is just because a friendship ends or you move on to a new chapter doesn't make that friendship any less meaningful. Like that helped bring me to a new space or place. Right. Thoughts about that? Well. Use the mic. I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, sure. The The... We live in, in, in segments in our life. You know, we, we go from you know, being the youngest person in the room to the oldest person, if we're lucky, to being the oldest person in the room in, in sequence. And each of the chapters of our lives bring new gifts and give us opportunity to give gifts to others. I mean, you know, every time I walk into this room, I feel guilty that I'm not here more. You know, I'm not going to make any excuses, but that, that's how I couldn't open the door when I got to the, because I didn't realize that it wasn't going to open for me, you know. And, and the, just, just what Mark was saying with, you know, the, the, the relationships that we have with, with people through our lives. I mean, right here in this room tonight, I can look around and see people that I've known for 50 years, you know, and, and uh, uh, some people I haven't seen in a while, and, and and it, it's such a pleasure to, to, to be in that kind of environment. And it's enriching, which I think was, is what you were... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Bechter, I come to you uh, as a patient. I am in my mid-40s uh, and just totally disengaged from the world and feeling depressed about it. And I really don't know how... I, I work. Uh, I'm a single dad for a 17-year-old and... Soon he'll be going off to college. I, I, my life feels empty. What should I do? And you only have one session to solve it all. Uh, do they belong to a synagogue? <laughs> Not yet, but that's, that is a great question. Absolutely, and certainly part of their depression is probably tied into the fact that they feel isolated or disconnected. And so we'd have to look at uh, what what would they like to do in order to bring them closer to some kind of relationship? It could be playing on a softball team. It could be taking a class. Uh, it could be volunteering. Uh, it could be any number of things in order for them to deal with that, that tendency to isolate and, and feel disconnected. And just to take it one step deep, but the depression really, I don't want to get out of bed some days. I mean, I do to go to work and take care of my kid. How do I overcome that? I mean, I want to do those things, but I just don't have any motivation to do any of it. Well, Rick, you're making this vignette pretty tough, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Obviously, if that person can't take the first step, we have to make the task more achievable. We have to break it into smaller pieces. So maybe, you know, connecting with other people wouldn't be the first step. It might be them exploring why they're so... Uh, demotivated and what they're afraid of. A lot of times people are afraid to try to be connected. They're afraid of being rejected. They, they don't think they're worthy. They have a lot of negative self-talk about what's going to happen when they have a conversation. So there's lots of barriers that people imagine exist that prevent them from wanting to connect with other people. That, thank you very much. Uh, and that wasn't a setup. That I, we didn't prepare that. But I just want to... I've never met the man in my life. <laughs> I just want to say to everybody, because you're going to hear it from the rabbis all year long, our job is not only to uh, um, work from our own space, but to see others in our community who are not as connected as we would like them to be and for us to reach out to them. Because I'll tell you what, if somebody called that gentleman that was seeing Dr. Mark and said, hey, you want to come to synagogue with me tonight? They might say no, but the fact that you called says to them, I'm valuable, I have worth, 
And maybe the next time you call, I will go. Please. Okay. He did a great job. He did a great job with that client. Okay. How would you have handled it, Dr. Linda? Uh, <laughs> the fact that he walked, that the client came to your office, and it was, I'm, I'm assuming that it was on his own volition, that means that he, gonna be, he's gonna, he was motivated enough to say, maybe somebody knows something that I don't know that will help make me feel better. So I would be using that in trying to find a point of engagement. You know, and, you know, if he says, I don't want to do this and I don't want to do that, well, you know, you acknowledge, okay, you don't want it, what are you doing here? You obviously are strong enough to know that this is something that might, might be able to help you. And you can listen to me all day long, but you can walk out of here and say, what does he know or what does she know? Well, and, you shared with us that you're in this stage of life where... Uh, you're a caregiver, and your husband's been ill, and could you just share with us some wisdom on aging and how to fight that loneliness piece or that feeling of being disconnected when you can't drive anymore, you can't do this, or you can't do that? What can you do, and how do you stay connected? Those are a lot of different questions. I know, just <laughs> run a with of, it. A lot of different questions. How do you stay connected? You look at the lowest common denominator of what's going on between you and your spouse or you and your parent or, you know, the needs that are, are, are presenting themselves and you, you break it down, as you said, in little pieces and you, you work on one thing at a time to show, okay, we have a little success here. You like watching ball games? I might hate it, but I'll sit there with them and watch the ball game and find something that I can say that I'm interested in because there's always always something. That would be, you know, a way to do, do it that way. And the other thing is in, engaging socially. You know, it, he's, a, he's been bedridden now for a very long time. But you know what? He's a guy who started um, a social group for men where he invited 20 men that he knew who were his friends to go out to lunch and he paid for their lunch and said, okay, who's making the next lunch? And if it's your birthday, it was his birthday that he did this. And he said, and if it's your birthday, you get to pay for everybody. <laughs> okay. That was a wonderful thing. Men, men generally aren't that good with that kind of stuff. So now it's payback time. So people are, I mean, he's got the most wonderful friends who show up, you know, hang out with him and have a good time. You know, and he's still capable of having those kind of conversations. Absolutely. That's super helpful. Um, I have one last question, then we'll open it up. Dr. Becker, um, we're talking about relationships and the power of them. At the very base level, what are some insights into creating a positive, healthy relationship with another person, a quality relationship? Well, I think everyone in this room probably has a handful of close friends or close family members. And... Those relationships tend to work best when, number one, you have kind of a shared value with that person. You have similar feelings about the things that are important in, in your life, and you can, you can experience those things together. So I think shared values builds a very strong relationship. And secondly, uh, managing the differences that exist between you and that other person mm -hmm. is very essential because... If uh, you're trying to be friends with someone and they are generally late and uh, you don't eventually talk about that, it's going to affect your relationship. You know, that's just a very simple example of we have to learn how to manage conflict. A lot of times when I bring that up to couples, they are, you know, they're a little hesitant. What do you mean? You know, we're not supposed to fight, are we? Oh, yeah, you're supposed to fight. But it's how you fight that makes the difference. So, uh, and obviously, uh, the, the final piece, I think, is just having those things in common that you enjoy uh, and enjoy and have fun together. So if you have friendship, if you have common values and you can talk out differences, you're going to have a pretty good relationship with that individual. I love that. Managing the differences, that is a, a take home. Linda, how would you answer, how does a person create quality friendships and, and relationships? Well, 
you got to get out of the house. <laughs> and uh, there's, there was a whole bunch of stuff that I've been reading lately about the fact that teenagers, teenagers and, and rising 20-year-olds, um, if, if, if their question of who are their best friends, they'll often name people they've never met. And they're, they're communicating through the internet and that has taken the place of relationships. And I, I don't think COVID helped us at all. And we have a whole generation of people who are now learning to, who are, need to learn, because it's lonely to be alone. You know, we're all kidding aside, it's really lonely to be alone. And so you've got to find ways to be able to connect and you can't do it if you're in the house. So well said. Uh, this, this could be the downfall of society, I mean, in so many ways, we'll certainly have relationships. Certainly have relationships. Um, any questions in the congregation that you'd like to ask? Uh, Diane. Oh, it's been a hot burning question since you got up there. Um, one of the greatest concerns I have was what happened during COVID to especially a lot of our seniors. I know it affected my mom's cognitive abilities. In fact, they went south because of it. But I'm wondering, not only the seniors who are badly hurt by the isolation, but what do you think it has done to the rest of, of society in general, um, trying to get back out there again? What, um, what are the long-term effects, essentially? Yeah, is, so let me repeat it for the uh, people watching. And that uh, Diane asked a really excellent question. What are the long-term relational effects, essentially, of COVID? And you started, Linda, with that idea, so take it to the next level, and then Dr. Well, Mark. Well, um, the long-term effects is that it, we, we took a chunk out of our lives, and we're trying to skip over it, and you kind of go, got to go through it again. You know, what were the things that you were interested in, for example, before COVID? You know, and some of these things are, are maybe still valid, or maybe they're not. And, then you have to look for other things that you can. Something's got to replace it. You've got to. You, you've got to. You got to get out there, and that's difficult to do. So you know, we're we're, we're sitting in a congregation of people. We're a tribe. We have something in common. It, I might not know all of you, but before we start, we know we have something in common, and that's a. I mean, that's a. It's bonding. That's bonding. Right. Mark. Well, you know, I'm not sure we know really the answer to that question. Um, I think it depends on so many factors, your own personality, uh, where in life this hits you. If you were a freshman in college, that had a different impact. If you were, you know, let's say a, an elderly person who, whose life was highly restricted because they couldn't even get out and go for a walk, then the impact of COVID for that person is gonna be different. I know that uh, you know, in my work, uh, it, it changed everything. We started Zoom sessions. I, you know, I couldn't do all, many of the things that I liked to do during the, during the pandemic. You know, I was taking long walks and listening to podcasts. So that became kind of my friendships because you know, we were all afraid of contagion. You know, there was a lot of anxiety. And remember, this was a sudden a sudden loss for everyone. We weren't prepared. It wasn't like we got into a spaceship and went to a, to a, you know, to Neptune. Uh, it, it happened overnight. So I'm not sure. I think we'll still be unraveling the impact of the pandemic for for decades. I, I uh, the way I'd answer your question is I want to be a sociologist 20 years from now, getting my PhD, and this is what I would study: the long-term effects on the world community of COVID, from the littlest to the oldest, because we, we don't know yet, but it had a deleterious effect for sure. Stacy. Great question, uh, and it is for those who are online. 
what are the long-term effects of social media on kids in terms of how they relate to one another? Kids are breaking up on social media and uh, communicating, dating on social media before they've met somebody in person. Uh, all sorts of different things. And uh, how are they going to be as adults if they haven't learned this as teenagers? Um, Linda, go right ahead. If you like taking that. Well, you know, uh, I, I struggle with, with how social media affects people, particularly under the age of 30. Uh, probably the most glaring impact that I observe is that it, it, it creates an opportunity to make a comparison to other people that makes you depressed. Because what do we post in social media? The best meals, the best destinations, we're always smiling. Uh, we don't, we're not posting the car accidents, uh, the hospitalizations, the illnesses, uh, you know, losing my wallet, whatever that might be. So kids believe that social media is reality. And uh, it's very difficult for them to believe anything other than that. So I think that's, it's, a, it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah, for sure. Did you want to add something? Well, it's a huge, huge problem. Well, let's come up with some steps that might help. Like maybe if, if you're working with, if, if I were working with an with a, with a adolescent or a teenager, I would look to see what they're being stroked for. What, what, everybody's got something. I've, I've learned that everybody's got something to offer in the world. And if you ask enough questions, you can find out something that you can help them build on. And because it, the name of the game here is to work our way out of this thing. And you know, part of it was when we couldn't leave the house, you know, the, the kids were on the, on the screens, you know, 20, 20 hours a day. Yep. And then when the parents thought they went to sleep, it, it continued. That's a very hard thing, cycle. It's an it's a addiction. You know, but the way out of it is, again, they're coming to the office. Somebody's decided that this is a problem. And the strength in that, if you can get that kid to, to believe in you and know that you trust that he's got or she's got something to offer and work that, that way and work back out. For sure. I mean, that's it, the art of, of the flip. That we do. The flip side of that, Stacy and everybody, is when I became a rabbi 28 years ago, about 5% of the weddings I did were people who made a, met on dating sites, and or you actually have to go and look at the books where. They had the cellophane covers and all that. About 85% of the weddings I do today, of all ages, from senior citizens to people in their 20s, are people who have met online. So there's, there's, if we could flip some of it to be really relational, and you know, some advice I give to people is, if you're in a three-week conversation on text, that's too long. About three texts and uh, then you go meet for coffee during the day and you have a human interaction. But it's a safe way for people to meet in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, we have just scratched the surface. It's only August. We're going to be talking about Better Together all year long in many different ways. And I hope you will, uh, if you are uh, struggling and, and looking for friendship or meaning, uh, you have rabbis, you have Stacy, Joe, Heather. We are here to connect you. That is what we want to do. And if you feel like you're connected, do the mitzvah of reaching out to somebody who you might know who's not as connected. Uh, that's one of the great mitzvahs we could do. So, uh, Mark and Linda, thank you so much. This is really fun and interesting, and we love you. So thank you. <laughs>